Okay, sir, we're ready to roll. We're going to talk a little bit about Korea, what you told okay. me on the phone the other day. Um, can you give me, the, you were with the Marines? I was with the Army. Okay, what division, regiment, battalion, all that? I was with the 5th Cav Regiment. 5th uh, Cav. 5th Cav Regiment, Company of 5th Cav Regiment, 1st Cav Division. Okay. And what was your rank then? When I went over, I was a 2nd Lieutenant, but a month after I arrived, I was promoted to 1st Lieutenant. Okay. You said you were wounded in October of 1951? October okay. 25th, 1951. Just, just tell me just briefly a little bit about Korea, why we were in Korea, and then your involvement in Korea. Okay. We went into Korea in July of 1950, and I was going to summer school at the University of New Mexico, and I was a reservist because I'd gotten a commission here in New Mexico State. And they first said they weren't going to take reservists, and I came home, and I was teaching, and I taught two weeks, and they called me into the service zone. So you went in in 50? I reported in September 50. Where did you enter Korea? Where did you, Incheon? Or? I went in at Incheon, but th that was after the invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, they took us, well, I went by plane from uh, California to Wake to Hawaii to Japan. And then they took us by boat to Incheon, Korea. And then they, we, after we got off the boat, we went to a little village and stayed in an old schoolhouse that night. And then the next morning, they took me online to my unit. I had no idea what unit I was going to. And I went to the cab, and I thought that was kind of unusual because most of the blacks that went into Korea went to the 24th or 25th Infantry Regiments, and they sent me to the cab. I, got, we, I went up online on July 15th, and luckily my unit was going back into reserve for two weeks. So we stayed back for two weeks, and then on August 1st we went back online. And walk, walk me through a little bit of that as you enter into combat and what, where you were exactly in Korea. I was on the west coast of Korea. I, my mother knew where I was. I didn't know where I was. You just go, because then you, you see, well, what they did at first, they gave us maps. We call them Google maps, but they were Korean or Japanese maps, gray and red, with their, whatever, whether it was a Korean or Japanese language on there. And they just mark the spots, uh, checkpoint one or two or whatever, and they tell you to go out and go to checkpoint this and checkpoint that. And finally, they gave us um, American-made maps, but there were a lot of errors on the maps. Once we were, our unit was supposed to move out and occupy an outpost. And according to the map, it showed three prongs or three ridges leading out to the outpost. And I was to take my unit and get on the third one right above the river, and the other two platoons were to go on the others. And we went and we went, and I couldn't see our, my, the other part of the company. I couldn't reach them by radio or anything. So then I just estimated, and I said, well, we should be about where the outpost is, so I'll just cut over. And luckily, I did it right, and we got to the outpost. But the map was wrong. There was more terrain on the ground than they showed on the map. So that's why that, that I was in the wrong place. I w well, I was in the right place where they told me to go, but according to the, when we checked it out, it wasn't right. But luckily the enemy had withdrawn and we didn't reach any opposition. And the company commander said, well, why didn't you send somebody to bring us in? I said, he said, no, they said, leave you out there. And we know there's no, no enemy there, but we could have been wiped out and they wouldn't even known where we were or anything. Uh, it was, it was an awakening because I had gone to infantry school at Fort Benning prior to going to Korea, and it wasn't at all like they taught us, because Orientals fight differently. They fought us, they came at us in mass, uh, blowing bugles, and, and at night they would fire flares and everything like that as signals, so finally, the Americans got wise, and each outfit had a bugler also, so if they would blow charge, we would blow retreat, <laughs> and to kind of confuse them. But they would come at us in waves. The first wave would have weapons. The next wave would probably have grenades, and the third wave would have nothing. They would just pick up what the others, those that had been wounded or killed, and keep coming. They would just, just come, hordes and hordes of them. 
Uh, and no matter how you fired, they would still keep coming. But we finally surmised that they were doped up. Because on some of them, we found these little white packages. We don't know. It, we knew it was something. But people have, it's just natural to be afraid, I think. And if people are firing on you, you're going to look for, for a shelter or somewhere to hide. But they wouldn't. They would just keep coming. And they would use little devious means, like if we were in a wooded area, you'd look and you'd see a tree. In a few minutes, you'd see the tree <laughs> jumping along because they would be behind the little tree, a little of thing. So we had to learn all those things. And they didn't like to fight at night. For some reason, they didn't fight at night. I don't know whether it was religious or what it was. So usually at night, we didn't have to, we didn't have to worry about them. They might fire on us. But we didn't have any, I don't remember, in our unit, we had no night attacks. But, so you had, to, what I did when I first got there, I had sergeants that had been there 11 months and all like that, and I told them, well, first they gave me a weapons platoon, and that's mortars, 60 millimeter mortars, and you just fire supporting fire. And I told the commander, I'm a rifle platoon leader, I don't, I don't want a weapons platoon, you know, they, they I don't know what you, I, it's not brainwashing, but they train you so well that you want to do your duty. And I wanted to be a platoon leader and be in combat. <laughs> I didn't know how, really how serious it was. And so our, when, while we were back in reserve, we have to get up every morning and have reveille and everything like that. Well, one morning while we were, and they were doing inspection arms and the sergeants had to pull the little pistols and, and one sergeant, accidentally coat fired through the company commander's tent. He transferred out that, that day. So the third platoon leader moved up as company commander and I got the third platoon. Well, I didn't realize you have to go out on uh, patrol and sometime if you are attacking, your platoon might be the lead, attack, lead platoon into the attack. So it was an eye opener to me, the things you had to do. And Americans are victims of habit. We would go on patrol and we would go the same route every day, every day. You'd go the same way. It would be a different platoon, but you would still. So the first platoon leader one morning decided not to go. Instead of going like to checkpoint 10, he went to checkpoint 1 and he reversed the route. And it was good he did because the enemy had set up an ambush for them. Instead of going up the hill, they went around and came down the hill and they could look down and see the enemy waiting to ambush them. So they would, but see, the thing of it was, you, would, you were supposed to call in, check in, and say you have arrived at checkpoint, whatever it was, and tell them what the situation was, if you encountered any enemy or whatever. So that's why they wanted you to go the designated route. Let me give you another thing that we are victims of habit. Usually at home, you have lunch about noon. You have evening meal five or six in the afternoon. Now they found that out, we were online, and one morning we saw these uh, about six men go across the horizon on the hill across the valley. And you call in for fire and all like that and you report you killed so many, 200 maybe didn't even kill one, but you report a big number. And we didn't pay any attention to them anymore. But that afternoon, for some reason, they brought the chow up at about three o'clock. And only 50% if you're two guys on a foxhole, so one is supposed to go and one is supposed to stay on duty, but you know us, we, your buddy go, you go. And just about everybody went down the hill. Well, I didn't go because it was about two miles to the, where they fed. And the artillery FO came up to uh, figure in his defensive fires for the night. They fire out of any approaches they think that the enemy might come. They designate that as fire mission, whatever, and they fire around a white phosphorus out there to mark target and everything. So if you hear noise or anything mysterious, you can just call in and tell them to fire on whatever the designated target was. And that's what he was doing with me because my platoon was down at the end of our platoon area, our company area. And it was like just a sheer drop off on the side of the hill. And I had a machine gun. It was my foxhole, a machine gun, and then a Browning automatic rifle down there to cover the approach because there were trails coming up. And uh, all of a sudden, little grenades started coming over the hill. Well, the Chinese had grenades. They were 
a bamboo stick with a little leather pouch on the end with some powder and stuff in it. And we didn't paint it, they'd throw them, but you would just get bamboo splinters or something when they exploded. And the guys would get them and throw them at each other. You know how we are. And so we thought that was some of the guys were doing it. And about that time, well, the uh, artillery officer said, I'm going down, and he left. And I had my uh, foxhole all set up. You have a firing shelf, and you put your grenades out there, and you your weapon and your extra uh, things that you need that you might need. And so I started going to Fox down in the Fox and I said, no, I better stay out here. And about that time, a Chinese stood up right in front of the machine gun and started firing. Luckily, he didn't hit the two gunners on the gun. And the uh, Browning automatic rifleman shot the Chinese. And then there was a firing back and forth all night. And the next morning, we went down to see if we had killed any. We only found one one guy, and he was shot and, and everything like that. But we got him, and he was just smiling and smiling. And one of our, I had a, a BR man named Zapinski. He was from Wisconsin, someplace in that area. And he wanted souvenirs, so the Chinaman had gold teeth, so he knocked them out and kept them as souvenirs. They wanted to kill him. But I told him, no, we have to send him back to be interrogated to see what, and they, he told us that they had watched us for about a week. And they knew our habits, and they knew about five o'clock in the afternoon, nobody was on the hill. And they figured they had spent all day crawling, creeping across the valley, and they would be there. When we left, they would just occupy the hill with no battle, but luckily we didn't go, the, the guys didn't go that time. Well, they went early and they were back. But, um, our intelligence, it wasn't very good. If you, each officer had, we called him a chogi boy. He was like a, oh, he would make coffee for you. Uh, we didn't have packs or anything like that. All we had was, uh, we didn't have sleeping bags. We just had a poncho because one other unit had been caught in their sleeping bags and all, all killed before they could get out of the sleeping bags. So they wouldn't let us have sleeping bags. So if it rained or whatever, you just had your poncho, and at night you just rolled up in your poncho if you, if you wanted to sleep. And so it was, it was, our intelligence wasn't good, but the Chogi boys would know. You would ask them, what's happening in the area? And they would tell you, according to the villagers, uh, a new unit is moving into your area. This or this is what is, what is happening with the enemy. And that, and that was the way it was. Um, then we would send line crossers out, uh, in, uh, to try to infiltrate the enemy. They would be Koreans too, but I never heard of any of them coming back with reports or anything like that. Because about the time we would send them out, they would put down an artillery barrage. And to me, that the guy would probably be killed. Um, we had a few, very few though, that would come in and, and surrender. Uh, I don't think any of our, I don't know of anybody from our units that, that went over to the other side. Uh, but I was surprised at the morale. Uh, the m morale was real good. Uh, they got a cigarette ration. And when we b went back online, one of my first jobs was to be a commissary officer. And they brought a truckload of beer up from, uh, from the rear. But on the way up, it rained. And so we just got a truckload of cans. They weren't in cases or nothing like that, but it was my job to, first they, the company commander said, give each man a case. <laughs> well, we were in reserve. But the first night they were firing weapons and doing everything, so he told me the next day, you take all of that beer back and we'll put it in a hut and we'll put a guard on it and we'll let each guy have two cans of beer per night. They can't, because they don't know what to do. Some of them had drank before anyway. So I had to go back and collect all the, the beer and put it in a little hut mint and, and uh, uh, then give it out to them, two cans a night. But that worked okay then, because they didn't, they, two cans wasn't enough for them to really to get drunk on it. But some of them they didn't drink with trade uh, their beer to somebody else. And I didn't smoke and I got a, a cigarette ration, but I gave it, the cigarettes to my platoon. Now this is still all 1950? This is 1951. Okay, so we're in, so you, you landed in 50, or you landed no, in 51? No, I came to uh, Inchon in 51, okay. July 51. Okay, we got it, okay, we're okay. That was about a year after the war had started. 
Okay, so what about combat? I mean, you're 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 a okay. over yes, a I, I put soon. Yes. Okay. Are are the men looking up to you? Tell me about the combat. It, it, it you uh, let me tell you, you have to establish good rapport with your men because your life depends on them. And you have to keep them informed. Like if the company commander would tell me, uh, our next mission is this and this, I would get my men together and tell them tomorrow we're going to do this, or this is our objective and we'll follow this route and everything. So the sergeants would have maps and I would have maps. So they would all know. Some of the other lieutenants didn't do that. They, the men, they would come over to our platoon. Well, what's, what's up? What's, what, what is going to happen? But you have to keep them informed because they're the ones going to have to do the thing. You have to lead them. But they'd always tell me that, uh, to me, a leader is a leader. You're in front. You're telling the guys, you don't hang in the back. Our second platoon leader would never go with his men. He would hang, he would hang back. Mm -hmm. Then we had one that would get out there and then send his men out. If they weren't getting any uh, contact with the enemy, he would have the machine gunners fire area fire to try to start something. And then one time the guy shot. They didn't hit him, but they just hit around his feet. Then he got transferred out to... Um, it's called fragging, I think is a term they use, if you kill your own men or something like that. But the way some of the lieutenants handled their men, I mean, they, they just, they weren't, they weren't good leaders in my estimation. They could have done better. Uh, then we had another problem. There was a gap in the line between the British forces and the American forces. And by that time, I was a senior lieutenant because a lot of the lieutenants got killed the first day online or they might last two weeks and that was it. And so the colonel, battalion commander, told me, you take your men and you go over there and you fill in the gap in the line. Because the British said they would move over halfway, but the first battalion, the, they said they, didn't, they wouldn't move. So they sent, sent me over there. And they were supposed to, they sent us at night by truck and they were supposed to have a guide in the valley to lead us up to where our positions were. Well, we got there and there was no, nobody there. So we started walking and we finally got to an area and it was their first platoon area. And the platoon commander was a Westborner and he told me, you stay here tonight with my men and I'll take you and show you the area that they are going to put you in. It was the area that the Chinese were hitting every night, every night. Well, the reason was when you go into position, you put in defensive wire and, and little, we'd hang ration cans with rocks on the wire so if they hit them it would shake and you could hear and you do different things like that to defend your positions and then another thing you do you reconnoiter the area when you first get there and they they came and met us that morning well he called the company commander and they came down and got us and they took us down to our area that we were going to be in and he told me what he wanted us to do and one of the things was to put in defensive wire and all in front of the area was rice paddy and they used human waste to fertilize the rice. So we had to get down. And so then he told me, after he told me he had to put in defensive wires and he told me where the supply point was and my men would carry the wire. And I told him, no, my men are fighting men. We're not workers and you have men carrying wire for your units so they will carry wire for my units. So, and then I called the colonel and told him to report and he said, you were right. They, they, so they brought the wire up for us. And we put in the defensive positions and everything like that. And then one night we thought the Chinese were coming through because they would usually come through that area on patrol. And I called and asked for a fire and they, they wouldn't fire. One of the reasons was that there was a limit. They rationed ammo to the artillery pieces and everything like that. There were so many rounds per gun per day. And sometimes you'd be in the middle of a fire mission and they would stop firing because they had fired their allotment. So they wouldn't fire for me, but the British were on our line. So he, the guy said, old chap, we'll fire uh, around to dark, designate target and then you will adjust from there. So they fired for me. And so we filled in that gap. And then the guys told me, we aren't eating, we aren't getting any food. Because when they, they would go down and the company commander told them, well, you have to wait at the end of the line. And when, if it's any food left from my men, then you can eat. And he told me, well, the, the sergeant would come every day to bring meal or food, rations, and all like that. So I told him, and he said, uh, every day when I bring mail, I bring extra rations because it takes a, t a while for the 
supply to adjust it for them to draw rations, but he said, I bring extra rations so your men should be eating. And so I called the colonel again. And so we had had so many little run-ins because uh, when the sergeant was asked, he said, well, let me get the company commander. And he gave me that same story that he was sorry, but they weren't drawing rations for us. And if, if it wasn't any food left over, my men didn't eat. Mm -hmm. So the colonel says, well, this is enough of this. We're, I'm sending trucks. We're pulling you out. Oh, then another thing, because after we got in all our defensive wires and everything and got all the positions set up, he was going to move me to another position because one of his platoons uh, hadn't uh, put in defensive wires. So he was going to move me over there. And the Chinese had been going through that area. He was going to move me over there so we could put in defensive wires and put, move his unit where our unit was. And the colonel says, no, we're not doing this. And if they don't want to fill the gap between them and the British, that's, that's their fault. We can't, we just, we can't do that. And, you know, they're doing us like this. So he sent trucks and we went back with our unit. Can you tell me, you said you received the Silver Star. Okay. The hill where I was telling you about a while ago where the, the Chinese gave us a surprise attack, but we were back in the foxholes. The Chinese, we found out they were uh, preparing for the winter. And they brought in, they were uh, putting in a defensive line and putting in supplies and everything so they wouldn't have to fight. This was in October. And so our objective was to crack their, their defensive line and, and everything like that. So it was a coordinated attack. Well, we'd had other co coordinated attacks that just didn't work out. But this time, each uh, platoon designated um, suicide squad. And that squad, you had a certain, each platoon had a certain objective. And that squad was to carry uh, satchels of Willis dynamite, his packets of dynamite, and they were to creep up and blow the lead bunker on the hill so we could get it, because they were all in trench, because all the hills were just honeycombed with trenches. They were good at that, digging all the way through a hill and everything like that. And so we, we jumped off at 2 o'clock in the morning so we could be across the valley and hit the lead bunker about six o'clock in the morning, just at daylight, and we did that. We got across, and um, the guys got there and blew the bunker. The only thing, they got concussion, and some of them were just laying there, you know, paralyzed and out when we got there. But we, our adventure was pretty successful due to the fact that they had been firing 155s, artillery pieces, direct fire, at the positions, and a lot of the, the uh, trenches had caved in. And as we went down the line, guys were stuck in the in the trenches so we, we were rather successful and we got all the hill taken cleared except way down on the end was a sniper and the company commander told me to take the rest of my platoon those that weren't wounded or killed and the rest of the second platoon put them together and swing around and get that get that sniper and so when i stood up and told the guys what we had to do they told me <laughs> Your, your legs are bleeding. And I said, well, I didn't feel anything. Well, I did feel something, because you know, if you ever played basketball and you get hit in the gut with the ball and, and you are hit in the nuts, either one, and you, you feel dizzy, but that's all I felt. And so I was standing and, and uh, but I told them, oh, I'll be okay, I'll walk down to the, walk down the hill. But I could stand, but I couldn't walk. Uh, <laughs> Like you say, come on, legs, let's go. They wouldn't go. And I, and I found out that I had no broken bones. I had a clean wound. The bullet went all the way through both legs. So the aid man and another guy came back, and they were going to do a hand carry to carry me down the hill. Well, when they got me up, I sat on their hands. The same sniper shot one of them right in the back of the head, and they dropped me, and the other guy ran. Well, they had put... We have these little packets of bandages that you use, and they had put those bandages on my legs. And so first I crawled and I got in a, in a shell hole, and I stayed there, and then they came back and they put me on a litter, because they, they, they thought they could carry me out, but the, the firing was still going on, so they couldn't take me out. And the, the litter kept you know, getting filling up with blood. So I decided I would take my belt and make a tourniquet on one leg and my handkerchief and make a Thinking a handkerchief in combat, but I always had a handkerchief. And I put a tourniquet on the other leg with the handkerchief because I weighed 150 pounds. I was skinny. And I just left them there. And um, I had a can of pears in my pocket. <laughs> so I said, 
And I didn't want to go to sleep. I was sleepy because I'd been up all night and everything. And I'd nod and nod and say, but I don't, because I felt if I went to sleep, I would die. So I decided I would get my can of pears and eat my can of pears because I had my little can opener. And I ate my can of pears and I felt okay. I got hit about 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, about 6 o'clock. Four guys came back, two from my platoon and two from the second platoon, and they carried me out. And it was, it was getting cold because, see, they'd had to cut my pants off to, to get to my legs. So they took me across the valley, and we got to the hill that we had occupied before, and they got some blankets, and they put on me, and that warmed me up. And then this is almost like mash. We started down the road. And we met a Jeep, and they stopped the Jeep, and they put me on the hood of the Jeep. And the, the Jeep was to take me to the aid station, and we went a little farther in the Jeep, and we met an ambulance. So they put me in the ambulance, and they, they took me all the way to the aid station. And they were just wounded. They you laying on the ground and everything like that. Well, I knew when they got there, uh, the uh, chaplain came up. He was a Catholic chaplain, but I knew him because he would come up online and hold mass. I never saw a Protestant chaplain, but the uh, Catholic chaplain would come up and hold mass, and he, this is kind of not good to say, but he would always have some liquor or wine. And after mass, we, would all, we weren't Catholic, but we would wait on the side, and he would give us all a little drink. And so he came up, and he told me, Fielder, I know you're not a, a Catholic, but do you mind if I say a prayer for you? And I told him, I really appreciate it. And then I told him, too, they wouldn't let me sit up. <laughs> and I said, uh, after the prayer, will you check all the equipment down there to see if everything is all right? So he looked and he told me, yeah, it's okay. You don't have to worry about anything. Because I could reach down there, but all I would get was loose skin and blood. And I didn't know whether everything was all right or not, but he told me, don't worry about it. So they finally got to me and they took me in this tent to, to remove the bullet or to take care of the wound. And there was a black nurse and she was to give me the IV or whatever. And, she, and my veins are very prominent. She would stick it in and she would take it out. She would stick it in. Take it. I told her, look, lady, I can find the thing myself. If you, so then she found it. And, they, and then they told me, first they told me they wouldn't let me watch. Uh, but it just sounded like they were cutting paper and everything as they worked on them. And then all of a sudden they said, no, you don't need to watch. So they just turned, I don't know what they did, but I just blacked out. And when I awoke, I was in another tent, in just at my cot. They, they had operated on me, and I looked like a mummy because they'd bandaged my legs from the waist down. And then here on my chest was a big patch of adhesive tape. And I asked the guy, did I get shot in the shoulder too? And he said, no. They took the slug out, and they thought you might want to keep it as a souvenir, so they pasted it there so I could have it. And then that was at a field hospital near Tegu, and then they put me on a plane, uh, not a plane, but a train, to send me to Pusan, to the hospital ship Consolation. And the little train, it was, had no windows or anything like that, but the, they had wooden benches and everything like that, but the little thing they put me in, they're built for Orientals, and I was really too tall, I couldn't lie down, I could just kind of sit up. But they put a young man in the, little, in the, th in the same booth with me, and he was real messed up and everything. And I said, well, you know, what battle did you, or what hill did you get hit on? And he said, I didn't, I wrecked a truck. And I said, well, how did you wreck the truck? And he said, well, I was driving down this road and I saw this old lady, she had an A-frame on her back and I saw a honey bucket. Well, a honey bucket is, they use that for disposal. They go around to the privies and take, they have boxes that catch the waste and they take the waste, put it in this little wagon and they take it and put it in the rice paddies. And he said, I had a choice of hitting the old lady or hitting the honey bucket, and I didn't want to get all that, you know, what on me, so I hit the old lady. But he said that was good because she was smuggling arms up to the line. And so I don't guess, I don't know where they put charge against him, but anyway, I got to the a hospital ship, and they operated on me the first night I was there because they had bandaged me and they had no way for the wounds to drain. And so they had to uh, put tubes in my legs so that the, the, the pus would drain out of the leg. So I stayed there about two weeks. And uh, yeah, about two weeks, because about the 14th of 
November, they flew me back to Japan because my wounds wouldn't heal. And I got to Japan, and the first night I woke up and my bed was wet. <laughs> and I called the nurse and asked her, did I think I had an accident? But that wasn't it. The wounds had burst and the fluid had come out in the bed. And there they had trouble. For some reason, there, I don't know whether it's a temporary or what it is, wounds don't heal very well. And so they told me they would have to take silver nitrate and cauterize the wounds, to, to cook them close, to close them up. And so that's what they did. And the nurse told me, now hold on to the head of the bed, because this is going to hurt. But at that time, I didn't have feelings in my legs. And they did the thing, and I didn't feel anything. Now, back in Korea, did you get a silver star, did you say? I got a silver star the, the, for action on that hill. Okay. Before it you says, were Yes, it says for gallantry in action. Then it said, even though I was wounded, I didn't, I, ref, I didn't refuse the evacuation. I couldn't go, because I would have gone if I could have gone. But I stayed with my men, and, and they, we successfully took the hill. But it was only one that, that we knew of. It was one sniper left, that, and they got him later. Because when I was back in the hospital in Japan, it was like homecoming. <laughs> you, I knew a lot of the guys. One guy, he'd been our 50 caliber gunner, but he talked with a British accent. And I heard this voice, and I told the nurse, I think I know that guy. I could just tell the way he talked. And then one of the medics that would come up to get me in a wheelchair to take me down for different exams, he'd been in our unit also. And there was another guy, he'd been our company exec. And one night the light came on in my room and this nurse came through the door. I didn't know her. Then he walks through. And he's, his name was Ockeltree. He was from Georgia. He said, come on, Fielder, let's go out. I told him, well, I don't have no clothes and I can't walk yet. And uh, so he was there, so it was, like, it was like homecoming. And I thought the morale would be real low in the hospital, but it wasn't. They were racing down the hallways in uh, their wheelchairs. They would call cabs and go downtown to the bars in their pajamas. And morale was real good, but they didn't want to go back to Korea. But just, just for a little bit, we're, we've got a little bit of time, but Tell me about combat. I mean, oh. are you shooting the Chinese? Oh, or? my gosh, yes. You should. You sh you sh well, tell me a little bit about it. Okay. What they're doing, what they're doing. Okay. You, yeah, you shoot at them, but, but, but uh, we, well, one time we, we, they send you out to your objective. And sometimes you have firefights, sometimes you don't. Because sometimes we would go out, one time we had a coordinated, tank and infantry attack. We had a new battalion commander and he'd been a tanker in Europe, so he decided he would take, we were on the Imjin River and he, we would go across the river and have a coordinated tank infantry attack. And they took us across at night and we could pick up the Chinese on the double E-8s and, and they told me, have your men bed down here and then we'll start the attack in the morning. Well, I couldn't lay down because I was so scared. That was my first experience in combat. And my legs would just jump up and down, so I'd get up and walk around. Well, some of the men were, were afraid, too. And the next morning, we took off, and the attorneys just retreated. We would get on a hill, and their little fires would still be burning where they would be making fish heads and rice and all like that. But what they did, they suckered us in. They went around behind us and mined the roads with box mines. And you can't pick up box mines with a mine detector. So then we had to stay out like on what we called a tank guard. But they, they didn't bother us that time. Uh, but we would have, one time we, we were out and they wouldn't let us withdraw. The Chinese were, were attacking us. That's when they, we'd see the little trees moving and all like they were just coming in waves. And we had to stay and shoot and we asked the company commander, we asked permission to withdraw because we were being overwhelmed. And they said no, because if we move from our position, we, they would lose a whole battalion. <coughs> so we had to stay. And they give you so many rounds, but you could take extra bandoliers with you if you wanted to. And so you would have, have, have ammunition. And we were using uh, World War II weapons and World War II rejects, you know, and everything. And the time when they, they told me that when they cracked the Chinese line, they found ammo and weapons produced in the U.S. in 50 and 51. And their explanation was that they must have gotten them from some Eastern European country like Czechoslovakia like that because the Americans wouldn't sell direct to the Chinese or to the, to the North Koreans. Were any of your men wounded or killed? Yes. Oh, 
Once we were in a, in a blocking position and, and they brought up, the, they, that was one good thing, they would bring up the mail. And they brought our mail up and one guy got a letter or a telegram that he was, he was a father, his wife had had a son, a baby son. He was so happy and he jumped out of his foxhole, was sitting on the side of the foxhole and a sniper shot him through the neck. And then one other time we were trying to take this hill and we got on the hill in the trench and it was an L-shaped thing. The Chinese were here and we were here. And we called in for artillery fire. And they fired, the artillery started coming in on us and my radio went down the hill, bounced down. So I had to go down there and get it and bring it back. They thought I got hit, but I didn't, to call and tell them to, to shift the fire. Uh, because sometimes when you fire by map and the maps weren't that correct, they would get the azimuth and everything wrong. Well, anyway, we got that changed. And then one of the guys, we, I got back on the hill and we were shooting at them and they were shooting at us and the guy just stopped talking. And I looked, he was right next to me and he'd, he'd been shot, he was dead. And you, you just don't know, I mean, uh, just strange things happen. Now, like, how why did he got shot and I didn't get shot and he was right next to me. Now at first, when I first got there and got back online, the Chinese that were there, we didn't, they weren't good marksmen. So we didn't pay attention to, much attention to their small arms fire. But then, the, the Korean housewives told us they were sending a new army down into the area and they were good, they were well trained, and they were. They were good marksmen and they were good fighters. So we had to change our attitude about, about them. And they were the ones that were well trained, they just come in waves and come in waves. And, and, uh, was it hard to lose your man? I mean, did you, did, you, did you help them? I mean, Well, the only thing you could do was call, and that's another problem we had. You could, they were starting to use helicopters to evacuate the men. But what they would tell us, if we got a man wounded or whatever, if we got them back to another hill out of the combat area, they would pick them up. But if we got a Chinese, they would come right up on the line and get them and take them out. But they would tell us, no, you get, that's too dangerous for our helicopters to come up. And we'd argue, well, you come up and, and our company commander was, oh, he would argue with them about the fire missions and them st stopping uh, firing for us right in the middle of, of a battle. And he says, I'll pay for every damn round you fire. Oh, no, no, We've, we have uh, so many rounds per day and that's it. And they wouldn't fire anymore. And they had, you'd go back in the rear and it was just acres and acres of ammunition. And, but they wouldn't fire. So under combat conditions, I mean, it's probably hard to describe unless you actually go through it. Huh? Yeah, it is. And, and then you have to, you said, sure, you feel bad that your man got killed because you feel that it was your responsibility. Another time, another platoon got uh, in a trap, and the company commander told me to go take my men to see if we could swing around and get them out. And I started to go around, because they tell you never go across the crest of the hill, the top of the hill. And so I started to tell him, let's go around on the lower side of the hill. And he told me, no, it's, it's, you have to get out there. So we started running down the hill, and there was a clearing. And just as about eight men got to that clearing, they fired. We said it was a tank gun and just wiped them out. And he, the company commander cried because he said it was his fault because if he had listened to me, they probably, so we would have probably gotten some killed, but not that many like that. And, and, well, there were comical things too because once they brought up, we brought up a replacement and he was a black guy and he assigned him to my platoon because I was the only black officer. And they, the company commander would walk the line and check them the foxholes and see how your position were because when you weren't, if you weren't in combat, you're supposed to be improving your position, digging it and doing this. And he got to this guy and something was wrong with his position and he chewed him out. And when he got through, he asked the guy, do you understand? And the guy said, no comprende. <laughs> he was from Puerto Rico. <laughs> and he told, he was mad with me. He said, Phil, why didn't you tell me he didn't? I said, that guy could speak English. He, he knew, but he just put that on you. He was mad. Why didn't you tell him? I said, well, you all should have known when, you, when he processed him through. Uh, somebody had to talk to him. Didn't he talk English to anybody? When you assigned him to my platoon, didn't anybody talk to him or anything? So there were, there, and then that one other time, this was when uh, there was no combat going on, but the Chinese were on one side of the valley and we were on the other. And it was a Sunday afternoon and the sergeant and I decided we would just be adventurous. And we saw this Chinaman. He was working on his foxhole, throwing sand out, throwing sand out. So we went down near the edge of the hill and I took his 
M1 and he took my carbine and we fired at the guy, but we didn't want to hit him. We were just trying to scare him. We were just trying to hit around the dirt around his feet and everything. He put down his shovel, picked up his rifle and he fired back. And he hit the bayonet stud on the rifle that I had. He came that close to hitting me and we said, we, we, we gave it up. We said, no, we didn't have any business doing it anyway. We didn't have to be out there. So we went back with the unit. Did it bother you to kill people? I mean, I know that's... No, it, and, and a lot of people ask you that, but you don't feel, you don't know them. It's, I don't know what you say, an anomaly or whatever it is. You don't know them, but it's like, it's either me or him, and if I can get him first, that's all the better. So you don't, you don't feel bad about killing somebody. At least I didn't. I mean, you know, you just figure, well, he's shooting at me. I got to protect myself, so you shoot back. And a lot of guys would, I'll give you another, when we, one time we were, uh, we saw these Chinese going down the valley. It was three of them. And the company commander told me to send two men to bring them back. And so I sent um, my BRR man and another guy to get them. And when they got down there, one of the Chinese started to run. And the BRR man, they carry a 45, so he just slapped leather. It was like Western slap leather. And he shot the guy. And when we got, he got back on the hill, and I told him he was, get, he was rotating. Artists had come in for him to go home. And he said he felt bad about killing that guy. He said, if I had known I was going home, I wouldn't have shot him like that. But the guy started to run, so he just he shot him. The other one surrendered, and they brought him in. Just quickly, I got a few more questions, but we're kind of getting late mm -hmm. in our time. But just quickly, a quick synopsis. Why were we in Korea, and who were we fighting? We fought, we started off fighting the North Koreans because the North Koreans invaded South Korea. We had been separated at the 38th parallel. And we were there to help the uh, South Koreans. And I talked to some of the guys that went over that first week in July 25th, 1950 or something. And they just went over in, in their khakis and, and low quarter shoes because they figured that as soon as the Americans appeared, the North Koreans would be afraid and would withdraw, but it didn't, it didn't happen like that and, and we weren't prepared. Uh, to fight, and then we started fighting, and we had uh, almost, well, I guess you could say we had defeated the North Koreans, but then the Chinese came in, and they came in in, in numbers, in great numbers, and so it was a whole different picture with the, with the, with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And then we had the limitation, you know, we couldn't bomb. They could come across the Manchurian border into North Korea, but we couldn't bomb them. We could see the airfields and everything on the Manchurian side, but we were not allowed to, to attack or to go past, go past the uh, Manchurian border. So that limited us in, in, our, in our fighting. Did the Army and the Marines work together at all? Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we weren't in the area where the Marines were. We had Greeks and Turks and Ethiopian United Nations soldiers in our area, and th they were good. Because, well, most of them are, are professional soldiers anyway. And back in the hospital, I talked to some of the Ethiopians, and they said that they dedicated their life to the emperor. And once they left coming to Korea, if they were married, their wife was free to marry because you were considered dead. And, and I know some of them got to go back home, but I never got to find out what, how did they bring you back to life once you, what, how did they restore your status of being a live person? Did, uh, did you ever hear of Pork Chop Hill? Yes, I, I knew. Is that 1953? Yeah. No, it was in 50, 51 or 52. You weren't involved I wasn't at Pork Chop Hill, no. Do you know of anybody that was? Mm, not in Las Cruces. I don't know of anyone in Cruces that was on Pork Chop Hill. Yeah, that's interesting. Let me ask you a question, Clarence, mm -hmm. as we begin to wrap up. In light of being a veteran of Korea and, a, and an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom means access to all the privileges of being an American, all the rights and privileges of being an American. Uh, the right to do something or not to do it as your, you know, as your conscience leads you. It means freedom of religion. Uh, to worship as you please or not worship if you don't care to worship. Mm -hmm. What about the price of freedom? You saw men die on the battlefield. I mean, tell, tell, tell a young person today about the price of freedom who knows nothing about that. Well, <laughs> war is, like they said, war is hell. And I think sometimes we're justified in, in our fighting or attacking another country. Sometimes 
I think we aren't justified in some of the actions that we take. But, uh, and I think there's a lot of propaganda. Uh, it was a lot of propaganda in the Korean War, I mean, about the situations. And, and I would get letters from my mother, and she would tell me things that I, I didn't know. She would know where our unit was, and we didn't know. We just knew we were in Korea. We didn't know, or we just knew we were on Hill number 331 or whatever that is, and we didn't know. Uh, whether where we were near or anything like that, uh, but I think to it's it's defending your your rights and your freedom and everything uh, against well a lot of them are, are legitimate enemies, uh, but it's it's hard to really describe it now because according Congress is supposed to declare war, but we didn't we haven't declared war since World War II. The Korean was, uh, situation was a police action, and these others are, Congress hasn't declared war. I mean, it's, and, and it's difficult to explain to somebody how these things can happen, that you can just go and start fighting somebody and you don't declare war against them. But tell me about the price for freedom. Freedom's not free. No, freedom's not free, so somebody has to give, give a life for it. And, and it's hard to explain, especially to a mother when her son is killed and explain why he had to give his life uh, and why her son had to go and somebody else's son didn't have to go. But now they say it's a voluntary army, so the people that are there want to be there. And like, well, before we had people to go to Canada and, and, and other places because they didn't, they didn't care to fight or they were conscientious objectors, but I think that's part of their freedom to object. What does the American flag mean to you and represent? It represents a lot of the things. It represents the red, white, and blue. It represents the beginning of our nation, uh, the 13 colonies. The stars represent the states. So it's, our, it's one of our symbols of freedom, along with the Liberty Bell and such things, Statue of Liberty. Those are symbols of freedom. Did you ever feel when you were over in Korea that you were fighting for God and country? I mean, did you have thoughts like that? Or? You just fight. You don't really... You're like a robot or a machine. You know you have a job to do, and so you do it. You don't have time to stop and think. Uh, is this, this man my enemy? Do I hold something against him? They train you well. They did us, I think, at, at Benning, and you feel you have an obligation, and so you do it. You don't stop and question the company commander. Well, why are we going out there? We went out there. Because sometimes we would take a hill, fall back. Sometimes we stay a day, sometimes we stay an hour or two and move back off of it. Go back a few days later and do the same thing. So the Chinese finally got so they just withdraw and wouldn't fight against us because it was, and, and then one time we took a hill and we asked for air support and a whole lot of stuff, we didn't get it. Well the British flew for us, dropped bombs and everything for us. Well a few days later, here comes camera crew and TV guys and everything and we did a mock battle retaking the hill and they dropped bombs on it and they did this and straight it was nobody on the hill but it was for for uh for tv or for the for the public in in the state so class were there bla other black men in the army and or marines in korea yes uh it was common or not common i mean it was well it's certain units now in in um at first they had the 24th and 25th regiments, and then they discontinued them, and they sent those men to other units. But there were other blacks, like, well, in, in the 1st Cav Division that I was in, in the 1st Platoon, in Baker Company, they had one black officer. In my platoon, in our, in our battalion, I was the only black officer, but let me tell you why that was. When I came back to Japan, and was in the hospital at Osaka, and the company clerk came in one day and told me the com the commandant of the hospital wanted to see me. So I went to his office and reported and I said they wanted to, because well, when I came in the door he said, damn, they did make a big mistake. And so I said, sir, what are you referring to? And he told me, do you know your records are wrong? I said, I've never looked at my records. A little second lieutenant, you don't look at records. Uh, and my records didn't go overseas with me anyway, my pre record or nothing. And he said, they have you down as a Caucasian. I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> but I know why it happened. I got my commission at New Mexico State. There were two of us in that class. And they probably, whoever did the thing, just figured everybody from New Mexico State is a Caucasian. They didn't figure there would be any, any blacks coming out of New Mexico State. So he told me, you better go about getting it changed. So 
when I got out of the service in, in May of 52 and I came back and I went to Albuquerque to the, well, I stopped in Albuquerque on the way home. And I went to the VA and I told them that my records, my racial designation is incorrect. And they said, don't worry about it. So they didn't, they never changed it. But now when they um, did away with the 24th and 25th regiments, they were supposed to send those guys to other units. And we in the cab were supposed to get some black troops, but uh, they, never, they never reported. I don't know what happened to them, but they never came to our unit. They might have come to some of the other units, but none of them came to our unit. We had, in my unit, we had a platoon sergeant, because after we got, I was wounded and the company commander was killed and all the, officer, the other officer was killed. Uh, a sergeant took over the company, running the company, and he was a black sergeant. And they stayed up there, I don't know how many days, and they didn't have any food, so he sent some men back to try to get some food. And on the way, they met these officers coming up, and they asked them, where you guys think you're going? And they told them, we're going to try to get rations for them, and he told them, get back on the hill. Well, they did send a, a captain up to take over the company. But that was strange, too, because the, when, we went, when we got online, the second platoon leader didn't come up with his platoon. He stayed in the rear. Now the company commander was up there, but then the guys told me when I was in the hospital, they told me later on they found the company commander's body and the second platoon leader's body. His name was Mac Alpine. It was just the torso, the legs, the head, and the arms had been, they were just decapitated. And well, we don't, the people that we were fighting against, we said they were Mongolians because they were huge. And as we went down the, the trench, and some of them were trapped in the, in the, where the things had caved in, we just shot them. Well, the reason we did, because when we would try to take out our wounded on a litter, they would fire on the litter, fire on the litter bearers. So we, we decided, no, we wouldn't take any prisoners. we just, you know, wipe them all out. And it was, it was kind of bad because when you get to some of them, they, you, we couldn't tell what to say, but they were like praying, please don't shoot me, please don't shoot me. We just shot them and just kept going. And I said, that's why I got shot, because I shot them, but I don't know whether it was retribution or what. But uh, we decided, well, really, when you get, uh, a, evacuate, evacuate a wounded man, you lose four other men, because you have to have four men to carry the litter. And so it really depletes your, your outfit if you, and if you have a lot of wounded, then you've got to keep sending people out, sending people out. Or you just let them stay there. You're going to let them stay there. And you know, what, what are you going to do? So it's a big decision you, you have to make. Uh, shall I let these men stay here or shall I deplete my force and send four men to take this man out? So it's, it's a, a, a platoon leader or even a squad leader. You have trim, life and death decisions to make. And you have to do them sometimes without really thinking about it. You just have to take action right away because it's important that you, that you act. And it's, it's, afterwards you think about it and say, why did I do that or why I should have thought about that more. But you don't have time to think about it. You just have, you have to do it. I'm gonna ask you to do one more thing that I ask all the veterans to do at the mm -hmm. end of my interviews. When I tell you, I want you to give me a salute into the camera. Okay. That'd be okay? Okay, just a salute into the camera, parents. Gotcha. Okay.